DrupalCon Amsterdam, and for some reason I'm again up here on stage. Can anybody explain that? <laughs> so yeah, my name is Chris Buttert. If you put Dries and me together on stage, you get Dries Buttert. We actually pulled off that trick a couple of years ago. Um, and hmm? seven. So um, it works better if I switch it on. Brief background, um, I used to be a software developer 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and then I ended up doing operations work. Um, today my role is I'm the chief trolling officer at Inuits.eu, which is one of the larger open source consultancy companies in this part of the world. Uh, we actually have offices right here in Rotterdam, Antwerp, which is our main office. Uh, we have one in Kiev. And we just opened one in Prague, which has absolutely nothing to do with, develop, uh, with uh, Drupal come Prague last year. Um, well, kind of, but <laughs> not really. Um, what I'm here to talk today about is DevOps, what DevOps is about, and the current state of DevOps and Drupal. Um, what I've been doing for the past couple of years is pretty much evangelizing DevOps in, in all kinds of different ways. And when I'm doing that in the Netherlands, we have a special term for that. Uh, then it's called actually ontwikkeling silp. So I actually wasn't planning on being here, uh, at least not giving this talk by myself. Kevin Bridges submitted this talk um, with exactly the same title. And then afterwards, he asked me if I could actually join him on stage to give the presentation. And then um, somewhere end of August, he had to cancel his trip to Amsterdam, so I'm standing up here all alone. So who knows what DevOps is? Are you guys sure? I'm going to take you back into a small trip. Um, about five years ago, um, Patrick Bruba and a couple of other people, we started doing this really small conference, 60-something people, probably around the size which is in this room right now. Um, and we wanted to bridge the gap between development and operations and figure out how those two groups could work better together. And well, yeah, everything else is, is pretty much history. Um, now we have DevOps days worldwide. Uh, every larger city in the world is organizing its own DevOps days. Uh, there's local meetups, there's local communities. Uh, actually at DrupalCon, this is already the third year we have a DevOps track. We started doing that in Munich um, with, I see quite a lot of speakers from Munich, Barry and Ricardo and who else was there who spoke there. Um, and then it doesn't feel that way, but in, in two weeks we're actually going to have the fifth anniversary DevOps party in, in Ghent. It's already five years since we've been doing that. It has been a growing movement and a lot of people actually are really interested in, in making this thing become a success. Well. Kind of almost, because th there's also, um, because of its success, a bunch of vendors slapping DevOps onto every single product they try to ship, which has usually nothing to do with DevOps. Um, we have new job titles like DevOps engineers and DevOps teams, and there, there's people actually selling DevOps certification. By the way, if you give me 10,000 euros, you get certified. Um, but th that's pretty much stuff we really didn't want to see to happen. So let's try to define DevOps for a while. So um, devs doing ops work. Is that DevOps? You'd wonder how many organizations actually think that we should just fire the ops people and let the developers do the actual operations work. You're laughing, but it's reality. In the back, yeah? Isn't that exactly what's coined as no-ops? That's the question. Uh, no, because with no ops, there's actually nobody doing operations because nobody has to do operations, right? If there's a bash exploit, nobody needs to do anything, right? If there's an SSL vulnerability, nobody needs to take care of it, right? That's what no ops is about. And f fundamentally, what no ops means is that you pretty much have outsourced everything to a software as a service party and you don't care anymore. That's kind of what lots of people do ops, uh, call no ops. So on, on the other side of the fence, there's Operations people writing actual code. That's DevOps, right? No. That's infrastructure as code. That's actually experienced system administrators doing their job right. 
And then there are some vendors who claim that continuous integration and continuous delivery, that's what DevOps is about. Well, for some of them it is, but it's only a small part. So yeah, no ops, basically using the cloud, that's all broken definition of DevOps to me. Um, there are so many broken definitions that we don't know where to start. Um, is there anybody here who's a DevOps engineer? Nobody. This is a pretty good crowd. Usually there's a bunch of DevOps engineers in the audience. I always ask them, are you doing development or are you doing operations or are you in agile? And then they look at me like, what do you mean? Um, there's also the new adoption of what, what people call DevOps teams. Is anybody working in a DevOps team? It's, did you guys have coffee? <laughs> no, I figured. <laughs> so the DevOps team is, they're in different flavors. And the most awkward one is the one where they actually put a team in between the developers and the operations people to create more confusion. So. Let's figure out what, what DevOps really is about. And in order to explain DevOps in a better way, um, I always have to come back to the definition from Damon Edwards and John Willis. So Damon Edwards and John Willis were the two guys who actually took DevOps from Europe and made it happen in the States. They started organizing the first DevOps days in Mountain View. And they also had, or well, still have, but it's pretty silent these days, they have a podcast called DevOps Cafe. And in DevOps Cafe, they were interviewing a lot of people. They were talking to a lot of people who they assumed that were doing DevOps the right way. And after a couple of those episodes, they finally figured out, like, there, there's four key components which actually make DevOps DevOps. And those four key components are culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. And for a lot of people, that actually resonates with what DevOps is about. It's about how an organization treats his team, how they work together, how they deal with failure, how they deal with learning, how they deal with adopting new people and new principles. It's about automating everything you have from build to test to deployment to pretty much everything you can imagine. It's about adding a lot more measurement than you are used to do and both on the human part, how do people perform, but also on the operating part and how do you use your platforms and how is your platform behaving towards your customers. And it's also about sharing, not only the source code, but also the experiences. At least it helps if you take the lid off. Um, so we had camps. And then the naysayers came along and they said, well, y you can actually rewrite camps as a scam, which wasn't really what we meant. So Gene Kim stood in. Um, Gene Kim, which you might know, who you might know from the Phoenix Project these days, uh, and Tripwire before of that. And he actually noticed that the large influence of Lean into that. So now when we speak about CAMS, we actually put the L in there, so it's CLAMS, and we can actually not make an anagram out of it so it doesn't become a scam anymore. And to a lot of people, that actually is a large, good definition of what DevOps is about. And this one might also be a really good one. DevOps actually is a culture and professional movement, and that's what Adam Jacob currently, I don't know what his current law at Chef is, but um, he used to be CTO, then he got some other titles. But that is also a fundamental part. It's not a recipe on if you do A, B, C, D, then you're going to have a billion doc billion dollars in the bank in a couple of weeks. But it really is a group of people trying to become better at what we do. So what is the real problem here? The real problem is pretty much this. And I keep using this slide or a variant of this. And each year, I hope it's the last year I'm going to use it. And each year, I have to run into the fact that it's still today's reality. There are still organizations out there who go to the operations people on a Friday evening <coughs> around 4.30, like, hey, guys, we have a national marketing campaign. Can you put this stuff live? Who, who has this happened this year? Oh, fuck, that's way too many hands. <laughs> I was about to increment and say we had it last year or the past five years, but it doesn't matter. So this is the fundamental problem. People put all their budget on building a piece of software and don't think about how to deploy this, how to manage this, how to keep this secure. Uh, and, and typically operations people come up with, hey, uh, does this need to scale? How many users do you expect? Um, 
What about security? Who's going to do the upgrades in six months? Who's going to actually do backups? Of the, do we even need backups? Uh, because sometimes people just don't bother. And the result of this discussion is that this is the relationship between developers and operations. <laughs> so what do you gain from adopting DevOps practices? Um, for a lot of people, it comes down to getting more features out faster. There's a lot of competition on the market. There's a lot of customer demand on getting new features out there. And if you don't get the new feature out there today, then your competition will have. So you need to be able to be much more agile in delivering features and software faster. You need to be able to get your features out in hours as opposed to years. If you look at banking, six to nine months to get a feature out of the door, that's the normal bank. Banks who are adopting DevOps, they go much faster. Um, you need to be able to do that much more secure. Security is one of the most undervalued parts of our business, but given the issues we had this year with Heartbleed and, and last week with Bash, more and more people are getting the wrong idea about security, but it is something we need to pay attention to. And we want to do this deployment and upgrade stuff in a reliable fashion, hopefully where not too many humans are involved. So if on Wednesday evening I get a mail from Drupal that there's a security issue, I don't want to spend all night fixing it. I just want the machines to do that for me. And the end result of that should be that we are as a trade as software developers and operations people, we are becoming, oh, that's the buzzer going off? <laughs> He's on call. <laughs> or he needs to write the slides for tonight. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, so the end result should be that we have more happy customers, developers, ops people, managers, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So DevOps and Drupal. Is it really that bad? <laughs> Some of you might remember that about two years ago, I set out a survey to figure out what the actual state of Drupal and DevOps was, how Drupal people dealt with delivery, how they used version control, and all that kind of stuff. And I presented the results of that, I think, in either at a meetup at our office or partly also in Amsterdam. I don't know. Munich, I guess. Um, so we had a bunch of results there. And then Kevin Bridges took that as an actual Drupal project. And it's actually now on Drupal.org. So you can actually rerun that survey if you want to, do that internally or whatever. And he reran it for Austin. And we've seen some changes. So I'm here to discuss a bit those changes. And while I'm doing that, teach you once again about what DevOps really is. So what did we notice? There's more people who actually started <coughs> adopting DevOps, or they think, because half of them has a broken definition. So it might actually be that they're adopting no ops. We don't really know. Uh, that's, that's a problem with surveys. There's lies, stamps, lies, and statistics. So I'm not really sure if you can base yourself on this, because we haven't spoken with those people. Um, there's more people who starting out to do this, and there's more people being pulled into DevOps groups. Um, <laughs> And then there's less people who don't know about it. So that's already a good sign, right? We, it seems like, like a lot of other communities, the Drupal community, is adopting more of these best practices to take away their pains. So that boils down to the question, how do they do this? How do you get there? And th the first way for me to start adopting DevOps is to think about software development and deployment in a completely new way. It's, if you are part of the Agile world, you, you know that there's a lot of discussion about having a definition of done at the end of each print. And as your team matures, it changes from being able to build code to having tests in the code to actually having code which is deployable to actually being able to monitor the code which is in production. And your, your definition of done starts growing. And to me, there, there's even a further step. To me, this is your definition of done. As long as there's anybody using your software, you are not done. You still have work to do. And that's the change 
you need to get aware of. You need to have a team which is building a platform, which is building a product, and take up a shared responsibility for that. So first steps to get there is to enable communication between development and operations, between the product owners, the business owners, the people who actually support the platforms, the end users, and to get that communication and discussion going on. See what is supposed to be delivered, do that as soon as possible in the process of your project, and then brainstorm. See what you need. Um, don't go up as a developer to your ops people and say, hey, we need MongoDB by tonight. Because they'll go like, are you really sure? Do you really want to use your data? And talk about why you want to do this, why you want to work together. It's about really building a much more reliable platform, being able to deploy faster and not to have work late evenings and nights. So technically that means the first thing you need to adopt is basically version control. Who's not using version control in this room? Oh no, that was not a hand, okay. <sighs> Who's versioning all the artifacts he needs to deploy his infrastructure? All the software. Who still downloads stuff from the internet? What if the internet goes down? Can you rebuild your platform? One of the largest discussions I have with people doing software development, both in the Java, the PHP, and other worlds, is what do you need to version? To me, you need to version all the things. Everything needs to be in Git. Don't pull out modules from the internet. Don't pull out libraries from the internet. Because when you need to rebuild that, and the upstream vendor has decided to, well, shut down his site for maintenance, you cannot rebuild your stuff. You really need to have everything locally, otherwise you cannot rebuild. So you need to have the source code of your application, the source code of your infrastructure, all the builds scenarios you have. You need to have all the tests in version control, all the documentation, all the monitoring script. Everything needs to be in there. So how do you think the Drupal community does? They're doing fine. There's 10% more people who actually use version control According to the survey, there's about everybody moved to Git. But there's still something wrong with those 4% who don't use version control. So once you start doing version control, you want to be able to move forward and build a platform, right? So you want to move to continuous integration because you want to have tests that verify that the code you just wrote is not going to break your platform. You want to have tests that are proving that what you wrote is actually what you wanted to wrote, right? So you need tests that actually take the different components of your infrastructure and your source code and the applications and some third parties and keep testing that and see that you don't break stuff. And in the ideal world, we go to what just Humble calls continuous delivery, where we do this through automation. We do build deployment. We do all of these things, and there's a lot of collaboration between developers and operations people which allows you to do continuous delivery. And continuous delivery has some requirements. Um, first of all, if you look in the inner side, you cannot do continuous delivery without doing continuous integration. If you do continuous delivery and you don't do any tests, then what are you delivering? Shit. Um, do you even care what you deliver if you don't test anything? So build up on tests and move from there. And if you want to being really good at it, you can go to the point where you have sufficient tests in place where you are mature enough as a team that you can actually say, we can actually constantly deploy everything that goes through the different stages in our pipeline. I'll come back to pipeline in a while. So this is really something you need to build up. You cannot start with continuous deployment on day one. You really need to start being testing, adding more tests, building up tests to a point where you are satisfied with the tests, and then you can move over and say, like, now we're going to actually deploy this stuff automatically when we're satisfied. And to a lot of people, like I said before, this is what DevOps is about. But it doesn't take into account everything else. It doesn't take you into account monitoring metrics. It doesn't take into account the, the change of culture you need to do in your organization to actually achieve this. To a lot of people, it's purely the technical part where we build a pipeline and we just do this. And th this is what a pipeline should look like. Um, you check in your code, there are some tests, some builds, it fails, you go back to stage one. 
you start over. Um, I've worked with a couple of organizations where if there's a failure down here somewhere, they fix it and then they just roll over. They just move on. They forget about all the tests they've done before and they just fix that one thing, potentially breaking everything else, and just move over to production, which is not what you need to do. You really need to go through the whole pipeline again. And then here is an example of a pipeline which is built in Jenkins, which has lots of tests in there which are all green. So it's really a good pipeline. So the exercise you need to do is figure out how to build a pipeline. Um, you need to start usually with an empty pipeline. Try to figure out how to deploy Hello World to your production platform. Because in, in most environments, you don't start out from scratch. You already have existing code which you need to get to production. Um, if you're in the lucky setup where you can start from scratch and just build something, then it's your first commit of the application which you need to be able to push. But in most real setups, you need to be able to take a part of your application and start incrementing and building tests on top of that and move further from there. And then you need to grow those artifacts. They need to go through a pipeline. And the definition of an artifact here is, is a pretty important thing. An artifact is something that needs to be unmodified. As soon as within the process of your development track, you, you modify the artifact, you basically invalidate all the tests you've done before. Um, if you make changes in that artifact, it's not the same anymore. It might be a small, subtle change, but it's still it's something different from what you tested before. So you need to go over your test again. So how about the Drupal community, you wonder? So according to the survey, uh, Jenkins usage has doubled. There's not really that much other continuous integration tools out there that are being used. But there's still, according to the survey, about 40% of you guys that are not using any kind of continuous integration tools. You're not using any kind of automated tests. Does that map with what you guys think? Who's using some kind of continuous integration tool? Yeah, that's about 40% who doesn't. <laughs> I think actually it's more than 40 who doesn't. And I, I tried to figure out why that is. And I was chatting with Joshua in the next room just before this talk. And what we were both concluded is actually it's not really a Drupal dilemma. It's, it's more of a PHP dilemma. Um, typically, a lot of PHP and Drupal projects are short on a really small budget. And people don't have the budget to actually invest to set up a test framework, to actually write tests. It's not because the developers don't want to do it, but because it's just not part of the budget. The customer does not want to pay for it. But on the other hand, the real question you have to ask is, can you afford not to? Can you afford to not automate what you are building so that when a customer comes up three weeks down the delivery and says, hey, uh, can you fix this and this? And you go in there and you break it, then you actually waste more time than you have as a budget or six months down the road where there's a security issue and you really need to go updating the site, but you don't know if you're gonna break it. So you're once again spending much more time in manual testing and fixing code and figuring out that you broke it after the customer called. You, you just cannot afford that. So it's always a difficult balance between building it up front or realize that you're gonna have to spend the effort afterwards anyhow. Uh, does anybody here, it's, familiar with the concept of, te of technical debt? A couple of people. So, so a debt, what happens <coughs> if you get a debt with a bank? Debt. 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 Hmm? You pay interest. Well, you don't only pay interest, but you need to pay the money back with interest. So each time you actually ignore parts where you know that, well, we should do this, but we don't really have time, chances are really good that eventually you'll need to pay back with interest. So when you talk to your customers and your manager next time about no, you don't want tests, might be a good time to explain him that they actually need it because I cannot afford not to have them. So. We were talking about testing, and that testing really needs to be in there. So well, typically when you start doing continuous delivery exercise, continuous integration exercise with people, you ask them what's in your pipeline. 
So guys, wha what's in your pipeline? What's in your built pipeline? Does anybody have a built pipeline? I see hands slowly moving up. Does, do you need more coffee? <laughs> yeah, okay, more coffee. I see a lot of nodding. More hands on the coffee. Yeah. So okay, if, you, if you're not awake yet, I'm sorry. Um, but typically, th the start of the pipeline is that you check out the code, you do a syntax check on that to make sure that it isn't broken like hell. Uh, if you have a team, sometimes you have imposed a style, and you check if that style is actually being lived up to. Um, you do some code coverage and see if there is sufficient documentation and sophisti sufficient testing in the actual code base. And then you move on with doing actual tests. And when you are doing actual tests, you end up with a bunch of testing requirements. And to me, that means if I want to be able to test something, I need to be able to build up the whole stack on which I'm going to test. And I need to be able to do that over and over again. Because whenever I want to run test A, I want to see that the result of test A is B. And if I cannot start each time at exactly the same point, it means that the second time I run test A, it's going to start at point C, and the third time it's going to start at point D. So it's each time going to have different end results, it's F and G. So I cannot compare. So to me, having a reproducible infrastructure where I can actually deploy and redeploy and over and over deploy the code I want to test is a testing requirement. That means that for, for those applications, you also probably need some kind of bulk provisioning where you take actual production data or anonymized production data and put that onto the stack so you're testing on the relevant workload. It, it kind of means that you need, in order to automate this, infrastructure as code. Um, and infrastructure as code comes down to, I want to be able to build up the infrastructure as code um, without human interaction, without somebody pointing and clicking on a GUI. Uh, like Luke Denise said in FOSDEM in 2007, if, if my computer cannot install it, your installation is broken. And that's kind of where you need to be at. So infrastructure as code brings us to, you need to look at your infrastructure as code. You need to look at the configuration you built on how your systems look like. And we're doing infrastructure as code, so we also need to take into account all those best practices we got from the development work. We need to do continuous integration on that. We need to do version control. We need to have different test development and acceptance platforms. And we can, if we do that, come down to a setup where the combination of the infrastructure code, the application code, together that actually builds the service you want to run. Um, one small remark, when we talk about infrastructure as code, we don't talk about scripting everything. We really talk about defining a state. It's not about install Apache. No, it's about make sure Apache is installed. Um, the difference there is that we move from an old scripting module, which a lot of the proprietary vendors are now taking and putting a GUI in front of that, to actually modeling your infrastructure and defining the state it needs to be in. And a lot of commercial vendors still have not adopted it, although these are IDs which have been around for seven to ten years. So with that in mind, with, with what Luke said about I need to be able to deploy my infrastructure and I need to be able to deploy my application, I kind of made this bold statement in Munich. I think if my computer cannot deploy your site, it's not worth my time actually deploying it. And that obviously brings us down to a lot of the new, well, not really new evolutions in Drupal, but it, it comes down to how do you deploy a site. There, there's a lot of ways on how to automatically, automatically deploy a site. And, and what we've seen from the survey is that people manually configuring and enabling modules from the GUI, that's down by 27%, yay. Uh, and, and using features, there's a lot of more people actually using those. So it looks like all the hard work in evangelizing is finally paying off. Um, on the same part, um, site profile installs, there's from less than 1% people who could actually do a site install from their profiles, um, at actually up to 6%. Luckily, people using database dumps 
is really down. And there's some increase in, in using features to actually do deployment. But it's, it's still not really big figures. It's not like the majority of you guys are actually doing automated <coughs> deployments of your sites. So our pipeline wasn't finished yet. Um, we build something. We do some more tests. I like to package stuff to make sure that the artifact which I'm pushing through the pipeline is unmodified. Um, I upload it to a repository and then I actually deploy it to a test platform. And when I deploy it to a test platform, that's where monitoring kicks in. Um, we have this sub-movement in the DevOps community which is called Monitoring Sucks because monitoring, well, up to like three, four years ago really sucked. Um, it's improving now. But part of that is that we need to put monitoring into our continuous delivery pipeline. If you deploy something, we need to test something. We need to figure out that there's a new service which has popped up which we automatically need to start monitoring. And we don't want to manually change those things in our monitoring setup. And why is it important? It is important that we also need to monitor the actual functionality of the site. Because part of the function of monitoring, functional tests, if you're writing them for your pipeline already, you can reuse them for monitoring. So when you do deploy to test, you can actually figure out, hey, I didn't break my infrastructure, my site is still running on the right ports, the right domains are still there, and it's actually working. So testing, 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 you need to pretty much do all of this. Who does all of these tests? Unit test, integration test, system test, performance test, security test, who does all of these? Yeah, but you worked for me, that's normal. <laughs> How do you think the Drupal community does? Well, given the fact that there is still not a really good adoption of automated tools, a lot of this stuff is manual. <laughs> and there's a large diversity on what you guys are testing on, but it seems that the focus is on performance, usability, and GUI, which kind of makes sense from a designer and an end user point of view. Um, if you look at automating those things, I don't know how you guys test, but if you're still not using tools like Selenium or Cucumber or Behat, you're doing it wrong. If you really think that testing is about, hey, let's go to the site, manually log in and click on some stuff, that's not something you can reproduce over and over again. That's something which is gonna bore the hell out of you and get you a burnout in like three to nine months from now. Who wants a burnout? Yeah, I guess that, nobody. So there is improvement, um, but not as much as I would have liked to see. Um, maybe one of the things to, to mention, th this could also be a cultural thing. Um, the, the survey changes from 2012 to 2014 might have been done in a completely different time zone because I was making noise on the European side and um, CyberSwatt was actually making noise on the US side, so it's not really 100% the same audience, but still. But anyhow, if, if you have sufficient tests in there, if you have a pipeline which has um, a, a number of tests which have been performed and people who have been doing checks on that, then there's the next part. There's the automatic or manual build promotion, and this is actually a screenshot from a Jenkins so we're sending a mail like, hey, I've done all these tests. They were pretty successful. Do you want to push this to production now? And this is, if you can reach this step where you can have Jenkins decide or any other tool, Circle CI or Travis or whatever you prefer, um, have them say, we did everything so far. Now it's up to you to, to decide if you want to go to production. You can have a build promoted and you can have that build promoted to the next phase or to production or, and if you can really read the small, print, this is an actual Drupal pipeline promotion. Um, or if you are so sure about your test, you can even skip this test and skip this step and do this automatically. But that really needs you to have a mature team that has sufficient testing in place and it also has some business requirements because you cannot do this with every type of business. Sometimes you can only launch a marketing campaign at 6 o'clock in the evening and you can only promote to production then, stuff like that. So we've promoted to a test platform. We 
have some done some more tests, we have promoted it to acceptance, the actual customer has looked at it and said it's okay, he also got a similar mail he pushed to production, and then you actually push stuff to production. Are we done yet? No. I see at least one person nodding. The rest needs more coffee. So no, you, you really want to close the feedback loop there. One of the ways we do that is by sending a metric to Graphite with a timestamp, and we say, hey, we got a new deployment here. And then you can put these things on the dashboard, and you can actually give your developers insight in what's happening on the platform, or how many times they have deployed, or what the impact on the database is, or what the impact on Apache is, or the load on the system. Did that change in your code actually trigger an increase in load or an actual decrease in load. You just pushed Nginx in between. How does your platform react to that? But more importantly, you can actually now also visualize business metrics from, because from all those logs, all those metrics you collect, you can most probably figure out what the revenue of your platform is or how many people actually sign up, how many conversions there are from free to paying users. Or if you're hosting an API, you can measure the number of times an actual API call is being made. And that kind of stuff can be interesting in figuring out where you need to focus on. If, there's, if you are exposing a couple of APIs and there is only limited use of one, you might not want to focus the next sprint on improving that because of those three users. But if you don't have those metrics, you might actually spend your next two, three sprints on a feature that nobody's using, which then it's pretty much giving you back that feedback cycle, which allows you to do continuous improvement. So, a bunch of tools there, a bunch of best practices, but it really it's not about the tools. It really is not about writing code and pushing it to production. It's really about changing the way we operate platforms today. It's really about people talking to each other and working together into building a much more and a much better platform. Um, I actually have homework for you guys. Uh, if you haven't read them yet, really go read Jess Humble's Continuous Delivery, or uh, at least if you're not really a fan of technical works, which would really scare me in this room, go read the Phoenix Project. Um, give the Phoenix Project to all your managers. They'll love it, and they'll realize how wrong they've been so far. Um, and that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, there has been, to my opinion, some improvement, maybe not as much as I liked, into adopting DevOps into the Drupal community. Uh, but if you want to discuss that later, there's tomorrow, there's a buff, which is going to be right during lunchtime. Um, for those people who want to listen more about DevOps topics, we have a meetup. The Amsterdam DevOps meetup group is actually meeting up across the street tonight. Um, Ricardo, who just fled working on his slides, is going to speak there. Bastian is going to speak there, and there's also going to be one talk about GitLab, uh, because the GitLab guys are kind of from uh, Den Haag, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And uh, for those who care about really advanced stuff, like Mesos, there is going to be a talk from Ben Hintman tomorrow at the Docker Meetup group, uh, which is going to take place. But in order to get into ING, you really need to register on their site, on the Meetup site. And with that, um, I'm open for questions on DevOps adoption and Drupal. Yes? Okay, so somebody's actually giving to away Jess Humble's book. Is this a signed copy? No? It's not a signed, it's not a signed copy. copy. Okay. So somebody's actually, uh, sorry, I don't know your name, my is going. Okay, so tomorrow there's going to be a giveaway in the continuous delivery session. Um, three? No, what time are you? Five at five. So if you want a book, go get it here. Other shameless plugs <coughs> or questions? It's actually good to hit managers with. When you end up in their office and it's an open shrink wrap. I had that once. Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, the deaf people and the ops people are kind of cool with adopting more practices, but any kind of advice on how to get the business people more involved? Um, 
I, I've seen a couple of things happen there. Um, business people and project managers, a lot of times they don't really feel the pain that's out there. Um, they don't see that developers are up till late night to fix a bug which the operations people have found because one of the things is they're not on call. Um, they don't focus on putting the right priorities according to the devs and the ops people into the next sprint if they're doing HR work. So, so one of the things I've seen happen in, in a pretty large organization is that they actually put business owners on call so that they learned which issues the other people had to deal with. And to them as a result, that meant that in the next couple of sprints, the priorities got completely rewritten. Um, they started actually focusing on stuff which was hurting them. And now it was actually hurting the business owners. Um, the second part was kind of already in my slides. Because once you can visualize business metrics, once you can actually see, look, um, we have an issue on the storage platform, and that means that the revenue currently is down like hell or we have found this bug and we see that there's no sales and there's no new signups. For the business people, that means money. They realize that they now have visibility in their platform and they can actually tie incidents much more closer to where they're putting their money or where money is not coming from. And that's also helping. Putting in metrics is usually one of the things I try to do as soon as possible in the process. There was another question there, yeah. So pretty much the question is we have a lot of small sites which are which have a short lifetime. Um, how do I see testing and continuous delivery for sites which are short-lived? Um, if you do a lot of those, what I would try to do is make a really good standard template from where you start building them so you can at least deploy that standard template and with that standard template have a lot of testing in there and then try to divert as little as possible from that framework. And, and really try to push it into a product. Because that's the only way you can afford to sell it to your customer. Because even if it's a site which is going to be only online for like three to six months, what I've seen is that that kind of sites are typically high profile sites which are announcing an event or putting up something for sale. And if there's a security issue there, you don't want to get your users to get everything for free. So you really want to be able to do the upgrades. and specifically in projects where you only have those short time frames, you, you just cannot wait to upgrade till it's over. You really need to fix things right now. They're usually also really agile, like, oh, well, users want to use it a different way. You only have like three months to get it fixed, to get the users on your side. Um, it really comes down to hoping that this customer is not the very first time he's actually building an application, because if that's the fact, you're pretty much screwed.